Let's see, we're live. I want to make sure somebody's on that we're actually getting people. Make sure I'm on the right page. Mm -hmm. I've done this the wrong page one time and I'm like, where is everybody? I'm not seeing anybody. Uh oh. Huh. Well. Come on, there's got to be somebody there. This, this is weird. Well, then we'll just have a cut. Ah, there we go. Good. Deborah, mm -hmm. Angela, thank you. I, oh, and Deborah, thank you so much for just saying instead of hi that she can. Oh, there they are. There is a little bit of a Hi, Eden. I'm going to see you in a little bit. Angela, Enid. Hello, everybody. Hi, Marsha. All right. And I, I, can you see the comments too, Jasmine? Just in case. Yeah. Perfect. Hi, Vanetta. All right, we'll get started. Hi, Teresa. I saw you had a text. I'll answer it as soon as possible. All right. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest today is Jasmine Singer. Jasmine is the author of this wonderful book called Always Too Much and Never Enough, and she's also the senior news editor at Veg News Magazine. So please welcome Jasmine to the show. Thank you so much for taking your lunch hour. We're doing this on her lunch hour. How dare <laughs> Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. I, I'm such a big fan of yours. And, oh, it's and, and Me too. You know, we just met a few months ago at the Spokane Veg Fest, and I fell in love with you immediately. If we had grown up in the same neighborhood and met in another time or place, like you said, we're sisters from another mister, we would have not only been best friends, but you would not have been bullied because I would have kicked the ass of anybody trying to bully you because, in fact, you were the cool kid. That is what is so bizarre to me is that you were the actual cool kid, and they just didn't see it, so shame on them you know yeah I, I like the image of you kicking people's butts for me I hope that it comes to be one day absolutely now I'm gonna be honest I didn't read your book I listened to it when I saw that it was available on audible you narrated it yourself and so it was it was even better than reading it because I, I felt I really felt your story you are not only you're a terrific writer I mean the you just are such a great writer you could be a writer like any kind of writer like novels because like like for example like I I, I took some notes just like to give you an example of like just the writing part like the words like you were talking about how your mom was very thin and in these words, having a svelte daughter was like finding an unexpected Hanukkah present behind the couch in March. I mean, the specificity, the visuals, I mean, you are a great writer. So if that's what you want to be, be it because you already are. And the narration, I just recorded my own book. It's hard. It's really hard. You did a great job. Now, even though this is your story, I'm going to tell you, I have a list here of all these things that could have been my story. So let me just tell you the things we had in common, and then we can talk about any of it. We're both Jews with tattoos. We both went through anorexia. We both went to college in Philadelphia. We were both aspiring actresses and had an addiction to processed food and tattoos. We were both obsessed with Bette Midler. We ah. both were addicted to vegan junk food and didn't eat vegetables. You until your 30s, me until your 40s. You, we both pretended we weren't fat when we were. We both ate purslane at some point. We both, um, let's see, there was so much. We both took herbal remedies for weight loss. We both took Fen Fen. We both were encouraged at a young age to shop at plus size stores. Actually, I remember the rude sales lady told my mother, if your kid gets any fatter, she'll have to shop at Lane Giants. And I'm like, you know, seven years old. And that's very encouraging. We both had trauma from a doctor. Uh, let's see. We both, uh, the only difference is I had a fat mom, you had a thin mom. We both loved our grandmas more than anything in the world, and we both have an extensive stuffed animal collection. So, oh I mean, God. there is so much that we have in common. So, awesome. no, Carol is saying she enjoyed hearing you speak in Spokane. That's Thank who. You. Oh, uh, Brenda said, uh, Brad Marsha, she's really Marsha, says she's glowing. I'm glowing because I'm wearing this new vegan thing it's a face that some it's something called becca and it's like it makes you glow so that's what you i'm are glowing, but i've I, seen you glow without the new oh, thing oh, you thank, you, thank you <laughs> we can talk this is your hour i want my my people to know who you are i want them to either get your book or listen to it on audible and audible is so great because i listen to you on the spin bike i listen to you walking the dog i could not put it down it was just it was riveting it was really it could be a movie it could be a life. your life could be a lifetime movie seriously that's how like a uh, unbelievable it is and you guys you know you can sign up for a free trial for audible and you get the first two books for free what have you got to lose right 
I'm particularly interested in your weight loss, both how you did it, because the people that follow me tend to want to lose weight, but also the reaction you got when you lost weight. It was so different. And you lost 100 pounds. I only lost 50. So, And I lost it very, very slowly. So I don't feel I dealt with that. But I'll agree with you. I think the world does treat you better when you're thinner. And that's the way it is. You know? Yeah, that was a weird realization. It's not like I didn't expect that that would happen at, at but I didn't fully anticipate the kind of reaction I would have to that shift in attention to me, for right. sure. Did you experience that also? Um, you know, I think because I'm so I'm older than you, I'm almost sixty, and because I did it so slowly, and I, you know, it didn't. It bothered me though. Because the other way, because now people are telling me I'm too thin. And it's like, I feel like I can't win whenever I do. You know what I mean? And it's like, why are our bodies as women or people just, why is it even subject to such scrutiny? Like, who cares? You know, what What about what's inside? You know, but this is the world we live in, especially where you were in New York and I'm in L.A. And these are places where people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that it was really shocking to me the first time that someone held the door for me. I was in my 30s. And I remember this one instance, I talk about it in my book, where I was getting the mail from my little tin mailbox at the bottom of the stairs of my walk up in, at the time in lower Manhattan. I'm actually in Northern California now. And my neighbor stopped me to tell me how amazing I looked. And I was like, and we had passed each other like 100,000 times in the past five years, never exchanged even eye contact. And he was like, can I just, can I just ask you your name? And, and he told me his name and I, I had this chip on my shoulder from it. And I started to recognize that it was happening all over the place. I had basically jumped the fence from something that the world had previously pushed aside and decided was less than to something that the world was celebrating from based on a completely arbitrary system of beauty. And it kind of fucked with my self perception for a while. You know, I'm not sure it's arbitrary, though, and I'm not defending people for this, but I've really gotten into listening to Dr. Doug Lyle's Evolutionary Psychology podcast, and I don't, and I'm not saying it's right, but I don't think the fact that people judge people on looks is arbitrary. I think there's a basis in evolution for for, for genetics. I'm not saying it's right, but it almost seems like the heavier a person is, the more invisible they become. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, of course. I mean, and this is something that's being drummed into us by like every single media outlet out there, hands down. And, and I, I get it, but there is some kind of lack of a backbone there that we have societally that we just brush aside. People who don't conform to the American ideal of beauty. And, you know, I am an activist. I've been an activist for a long time, but it wasn't until I was are what I would still call like celebrated for basically something as 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 fluffy as what I looked like that I realized all of the ways that I had been running from my own truth. And that's something that I talk about in my book. And that's something that I was able to ultimately uncover through the power of plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how long were you, when did you first become vegan? I forget the age, even though I read your book. It was like in college, right? Well, I was 24 when I went vegan. I had been, uh, I, I had been vegetarian since I was 19. So I was vegetarian 19, vegan at 24, I'm 38 now. Wow. Okay. And so did you as a vegan get any criticism from other vegans when you were a heavier vegan? Because I did. That's what shocked me is that it wasn't like the regular world was calling me fat, but it was the vegans. Yeah. Well, okay. So what happened for me was I, 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 I'm guessing you have a similar story, but I wound up replacing my addiction to processed food with basically the vegan version of that very same addiction. I went vegan for the animals. I remained vegan for the animals. But when I went vegan, I still was just eating cupcakes and pizza and macaroni and cheese. It just was like not with animal products. And so I just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and just feeling sicker and sicker and sicker. And the feedback I would get from vegans was, you know, I think it was a little careful because people knew that I would bite back at this point, but there was definitely a, a lot of overlooking me that stuff that I realized after I lost the weight was absolutely the way it was. It was shocking, AJ. Like, I'm still upset about it. I've come to terms with it a lot, but it, it really brings to me the clarity of how we have to be kind to people because they're all in their own journey. And for me, I have, 
Mm -hmm. I had to extend that to my to myself. It took me a really, really long time to figure that out. I am all for people being kind. I'm all for empowering people, especially women. A few weeks ago, I interviewed Chef Del Sroof, who was on his own journey with weight loss. And and he was being bullied on the Internet recently. And I, it's just not acceptable. It, it, it's I mean, I want people to be happy. And I think when you if you're overweight, you're maybe not as healthy. And, and I really want people to be healthy. And that's really what I want. And I want people to eat plants and that will get you healthy. Yeah. I mean, for me, it started with the, the power of plants was the first step in finding how to live in alignment with my ethics. And so that was ultimately why I went vegan. But part of those ethics that I was still hiding behind the junk food was the ethics of respecting my own animal rights. And it wasn't until I was 30 and I found out that I was actually on my way to heart disease. Even though I had been a long time vegan, I couldn't go up a flight of stairs without stopping to like check a pretend text message really so that I could just catch my breath. And I was told by my doctor, my, you know, my triglyceride levels were off the charts. I was unhealthy. I was sick. And that's when I ate a, for a vegetable, pr probably for the first time. What was the first vegetable you ate? It was, it was actually juice. I started oh, juice. Well, I remember you were inspired by the documentary Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, and you started your journey with, with like many people do, with a juice cleanse. Can I just ask you something? Um, in the, because you had that whole list of our similarities. Did you grow up eating the kind of Weight Watchers well, like, my mom was always on a diet. My mom, even though your mom was thin, she was also on a diet too. So our moms were similar and that my, mine was morbidly obese. We ate the tradi traditional Jewish American diet, the standard Jewish American diet. So, you know, lox and bagels with cream cheese and brisket and all those rich foods. And, and my mom cooked every night and there was a salad and vegetable, but there was a lot of processed crap in the house. You know, every kind of breakfast cereal, Captain Crunch with crunch berries, fruity pebbles, you know, I, I, ice creams, chips, all that stuff. So we had quote healthy food food, but we had a lot of processed junk. So I became addicted to regular processed food when I was a kid. And then when I became vegan at 17, I just switched it from standard American processed food. to There wasn't really vegan processed food in 1977. So it was chips and French fries and Dr. Pepper and Coke Slurpees and that kind of thing. So we had very similar. But, you know, I love when you take that, the smoochies thing cracked me up because your smoochie thing, that the ice cream treat you ate, I used to work my very first job when I was, I believe, who was I? I was probably 14, was in a diet dessert bakery called The Thinnery. And so we had something similar to smoochies. And I would kid myself and eat these, you know, diet desserts that were so-called healthy, but they were basically processed crap. Well, the marketing is really powerful. And, you know, they're basically banking, literally, on our willful ignorance to continue to consume more and more and more. And as you know, there's like a total... Uh, there, there's a total physical addiction component to it as well. So it's like physical addiction and then it's buying the marketing and smoochies, just for those of you who don't know what it is. It was a low calorie frozen yogurt line that came in like a hundred different flavors. And I basically ate it at some point for breakfast, lunch and dinner thinking that would be my key to health. Right. So yeah, for sure. And I grew up not eating what you just said, but I grew up in the fluorescent 1980s uh, having those, those little cardboard microwavable Weight Watchers meals. I remember those. I remember. Well, you actually worked for Weight Watchers for a while. That's hilarious. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I just thought that was so interesting. Well, let me tell you, this is actually the funniest. This to me was like mind boggling. When I was uh, 24, so the year I went vegan, I, I was trying to be an actor in New York City and I wanted to lose weight and so i lost a bunch of weight basically in the un every kind of unhealthy way you can imagine i lost weight and i got a job at weight watchers as the receptionist the person who weighs people in but you have to keep your weight to a certain level in order to maintain your job and so i couldn't lose anymore because i was binging and i was secretly eating and i was eating smoochies and then i would starve myself for a day and then i would eat you know all of it so in order to keep my weight down, to keep my job at Weight Watchers, I joined Jenny Craig. That's so funny. That is one of my favorite parts of the book. That is hilarious. Yeah, sort of. It, it was, I, you know, it was all very secretive. It felt like a drug deal. Like they delivered the food to my apartment. I like opened the door, looked both ways. No one's there. Bring it inside. Put it in my cabinets. And I lost weight again. Because yeah, you're doing portion control with unhealthy food. But I love how you say now you don't have to portion control. 
Right. Well, that was something that definitely changed on a you know foundational level for me. Definitely, it uh, you know it felt very much like liberating myself. And like I talked about, I'm an animal activist. Like I've been working for the liberation of animals for as long as I can remember. And it was liberating to me to realize that I didn't need to continue to hide behind all of this crap. You know, so that was that was a big part of my story. Coming to terms with my thin mother, known in the book as TM, only as TM, but coming to terms with like her view of herself, how that shaped me and my view of myself, weighing that, so to speak, with how the world was treating me based on their perception of me, and finally saying, fuck it. I need to do what is right for me. And what I found out was right for me was a whole foods plant-based diet. Absolutely. You know, I, I did you think of the title of your book yourself? No. <laughs> well, it's a great title because to me, it's almost like a metaphor for how you felt about yourself. But it's also um, it's also what processed food is, because, you know, there's a saying in the food addiction circles that one bite is too many and a thousand bites is never enough. And processed foods is like that because it's it's it is so addictive that it's always too much but it's never going to be enough but i'm uh, i'm assuming that that's kind of how you felt about yourself in, yeah. in most situations right. that you too much but also never enough so i kind of like the comparison of of kind of you to process foods in a well way. always too much and never enough can speak to so many different what my mother expected of me or what i expected of myself but it was also of course the food i was eating it was always too much and never enough and it's a concept that i think is universal which is something I didn't quite realize until I was on a book tour and people would come up to me afterwards and say, I totally identify with this. And I realize, AJ, that what you've been doing for so long is kind of saying, hey, you guys, we're all in this together. We all have the same struggles at night. We all wake up in the middle of the night thinking the same damn things about ourselves and what we're consuming. And we're all trying to break these toxic patterns. That's what my book is pretty much about. It's my own so person. inspiring, I think, especially for women, because women especially struggle with the self-esteem from their weight and their body image and how they look and it's amazing to me that at your young age like this is a kind of memoir you think for somebody in their 70s or 80s to write so I'm sure you have another book in you because it, it's so well written and it's just I think everyone should read it just because it's it's so it's it's it's, un, it's unbelievable how much has happened to you already in your life you know I'm imagining it's a, a lot brighter now mostly I mean you know we don't solve everything immediately we're all on our own journeys I'm I consider myself a lifelong learner and I think I will say with the food yes I have that down but of course the underlying issues wind up popping up in different areas and and it's something that I'm constantly committed to being realistic about and and trying to trying to figure out <laughs> It reminds me of that arcade game where these little things pop yeah. up and you have like a mallet. And as soon as you get one, another one pops up, you know, We're all human. I'm everybody else. I don't have this down completely. That book is a snippet in time, you know, and, and it's, it's something that will continue to evolve as, as I continue to evolve. So I'm really grateful for the so opportunity. Many people, so many people are saying they love your book. They love your story. You're inspiring. They couldn't put your book down. And I think when, when people write books like you did, I, I, my, or the talk I gave at McDougal where I bared my soul, I think it gives other people the courage to be themselves and tell their story, mm -hmm. you know, and not to hide and not to feel so ashamed. Because if we can say the kind of stuff that happened to us, it's like, this is universal. It's just that people are ashamed or embarrassed to talk about it. And when you, you know, they say we're only as sick as our secrets. And when you get it out there, you give other people the courage to heal. That's what I think. I do believe in the power of personal narrative to create social change. I believe that like it, it starts with uh, change from inside of ourselves. They're very connected. And so I hope that everybody who's watching this finds the courage or the strength or the platform to tell their story because we should be. That's how we will change as a society. Absolutely. One of the things I forgot we had in common, cherries. You love cherries. I love cherries. I love I, cherries. I know, me too. It's like, I swear, with this, I, I, maybe my father was tra traveling you, wherever your mom lived. And somehow, <laughs> oh, this, is, this is just this is incredible. So if, do you have a way for people to follow you? Do you have a blog? I want people that are not familiar with you to be familiar with you, whether they read your book or not. So how do people find out more about Jasmine Singer? Oh, thank you. Well, jasminesinger.com. There's no E on Jasmine. So it's J-A-S-M-I-N at singer.com. I'm constantly giving talks. I had a TED talk come out recently called Compassion Unlocks Identity. And I am the co-host and co-founder of Our Hen House. So if people want to listen to my podcast, we are 410 episodes in. We've been doing it for wow. like eight years. 
And so you could, it's every week it comes out. You could check that out at our henhouse.org or on iTunes or whatever. You could follow me on Facebook, Jasmine Singer. On uh, Twitter, it's Jasmine underscore Singer. And on Instagram, I'm Jasmine Singer author. I'm also the senior editor for Veg News Magazine. Oh, oh, when did that happen? I didn't even know that. That's pretty cool. Because <laughs> that's not. That, that happened since my book came out. So, uh, yeah, I've been the senior editor for Veg News for a little over a year. I had written freelance for Veg News for many, many years, like over a decade. And I wound up moving to Northern California to take this job. And I've been here since last uh, August of 2016. And so I keep very, very busy because I still do our head house. I'm still on a book tour and I'm I'm helping to head up editorial at Veg News, which is the world's leading vegan media brand. And we have a beautiful magazine, absolutely beautiful. So I do encourage people to check it out. Uh, we have some really exciting articles coming out, including Veg News' Guide to Greens, which I think your viewers would be really interested in. Yes, absolutely. That, that's, that's right up our alley. So how, in what time period did you lose this 100 pounds? That's, I, I'm really interested in your weight loss story because there's people writing about their struggles with food and they don't think they can ever do it or go a day without this or that. And, 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 and because I think your whole story is inspirational, but so many people resonate with the weight loss part because that is a goal for them, whether it's for health or vanity. And I love when people actually have accomplished it. So could you talk a little bit about how it started with the juice fast and then it went on to a whole lifestyle change? So I was in New York, and as I mentioned, I had gone to the doctor. I was told, eh, not doing so good, 30-year-old Jasmine. By the way, I had like a, a master's degree in health, and <laughs> I had to be a holistic health counselor for a while as well. And yet, my and I was a longtime vegan. I was extremely knowledgeable about these issues, but there was just a, di a total divide between reality and my consumption. So I went out to San Francisco. I was given a press copy, an advanced press copy of the documentary fat, sick, and nearly dead, which highlights Joe Cross as he travels across the country and juice fasts his way back to health. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And it, it wound up being, you know, it wound up being a, a journey that I was ready for. It was like the final thing was not that hard to just try it. I tried it for 10 days in 2010, September 1st. 2010. September 1st, wait a minute, another, it's like we have parallel lives. September 1st is the day I went vegan in 1977. <laughs> Too much coincidence about our lives. That's that so funny. Vegan, that, that anniversary. Vegan Where do you have like moles on your body? Do you, I'm not, just, don't like, have moles. Your the one thing I forgot is we both sucked at physical education. That was another thing. I was so brutally, I wasn't so much bullied or teased by my classmates because I was really smart and funny, but those PE teachers in junior high, they were mean. Yeah, they were not nice. A fat ass, you know? I mean, my God, they, I mean, today if they did that, they, they, I had a phys ed teacher in elementary school, like grab my face and like, you know, and shake my face. Like, do you hear me? Like holding my face. And I was, I think about that every now and then, like he would be out. Oh my know? God. Absolutely. Yeah, horrible. Yeah. Anyway. Go, yeah. So go, go back to the document. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So God, we have so much to talk about. Uh, yeah. So, so I was, you know, partnered with Marianne at the time, the, who I was with for 10 years and we she's the co-host of our hen house and and we did it together we went on a juice fast for 10 days and i lost 11 pounds and i like my it, it's like one of those stories that's annoying to hear because like my skin cleared up my energy felt better and it wasn't hard and it was like the first time in my life that i was flooding my body with the nutrients it needed and breaking out of all of those addictions that had spent the past three decades creeping in. But what did it differently from all of the diets I had done in the past is that I actually was taking a break from the consumption habits that I had in order to actually provide abundance as opposed to deprivation, an abundant of that amount of vegetables, an abundant amount of nutrients. And I was removing all of the processed foods 100% it gave me a mental break to think about the reasons why I was consuming those foods in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I, I did it again the next day. 
that. I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, you can't stay on, I mean, maybe you could, but I don't recommend people stay on juice forever, but it's such a great reset because you're not getting sugar, fat, and salt, which is basically what processed food is. And, and not everybody can go to True North and do a water fast. But you can do a juice fast on your own at home. And especially if you do mostly greens. And I think it's, I did one once for five days. I think it's great. I do. I want to add that. To, I want to add to what you're saying. I don't think juice fasts are necessary for everyone. I don't think everyone should juice fast. I read all of the, you know, people who, all of the naysayers about juicing. I, I hear you. It worked for me. For three years, it worked for me. Every month, I did a juice fast. Ten days one month, three days the next, ten, then three, then ten, then three. I personally needed that kind of a hard line drawn in the sand because it was the only kind of structure that I had in place. And in between, I was following a whole foods diet as prescribed by, you know, eat to live. That, that's the that's the key, though. You know, they I think it was, it was a Schopenhauer. Somebody said that music is actually the space between the notes where there's no sound. And, and a healthy lifestyle is the space between the fasts and the cleanse. Because so many people I see that go to True North, that juice fast or water fast, come back a year later fatter and sicker because they're not following a whole food plant-based diet right. in between. So you were actually eating healthfully in between these fasts. Well, that was what was shocking. And I know that there's going to be like at least a third of the viewers right now who are going to want to throw a tomato at me for saying this. But I actually craved the healthy foods at that point. Like well, you, while I was on the juice fest, I started to be like, what are these cravings? They're no longer Oreos. What? They're <laughs> vegetables. And all I wanted was a giant plate of like steamed bok choy and all of these things that had been so foreign to me. And then it was wasn't hard. It just wasn't hard anymore. It was right. easy. Right. Like, and they, the way less what? They because the, what you're speaking is the truth. We see this in True North. What you're talking about is neuroadaptation. When you when you get used to, when your taste buds get used to healthy food, you actually crave healthy food. Totally. Well, I mean, it's yeah, it's also one big metaphor, isn't it? Like once we get rid of the toxic people in our life and we surround ourselves with the good ones and with the people who are right for us. Those are the people we want to be around. It's just, it, it seems so obvious. And yet there is a total divide from that reality until you are in it. So it requires a leap of faith because it's scary. It's still scary for me now, to be honest. So like right before a, a juice cleanse or whatever, to feel like, oh crap, I'm going to be without. I'm going to be without all of these things that help me get through my unbelievably busy days. But as soon as I'm in it, something switches and it's not hard. No, right, absolutely. That's what I hear from everybody that either juice fast or water fast. At what period of time did it take you to lose 100 pounds? Three years, three yeah, years. So, yeah. um, but the, the first year was the bulk of it. And then and then it was, you know, 25 pounds the, throughout the next two years. Yeah, terrific. So, terrific. And you did it without exercise. The last year I started running, but it, I don't, feel, I'm sure that there, I'm sure that I could be, this could be disproven, but I, I felt like my exercise, my physical exercise, my running, it felt related to mental health to me. Right. This again, we're exactly the same. I didn't start exercising till I lost all my weight. And it was because my psychologist, Doug Lyle said, you want to get rid of that anxiety. You got to start moving your body. That's yeah, for sure. But I, I, for me, and I know that there's a whole scientific thing about calories in, calories out. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a pure anecdote here. For me, it was the, the weight loss has nothing to do with my exercise. Like mm -hmm. it just, that's why I get, you know, I'm fascinated by those weight loss shows, like The Biggest Loser. I'm fascinated by them because I'm a bit of a voyeur, but, uh, and they're well produced and, you know, they're compelling, but I think it's bullshit. I mean, yeah. they're just talking about exercise. Like what human being is going to spend 12 hours of their day working out? They get next to no nutritional advice. And when they do, it's based on the sponsors from the commercials. It's just, it's annoying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it just became, it had to kind of become a separate thing. And you know what? The other thing that I find sort of interesting about my journey is that my weight loss was actually not about weight loss. It was almost like this side thing that was happening. It, and that was the other thing that made me succeed in it. It wasn't about like, oh my gosh, I'm this much weight down this week. It wasn't about that. It was about just, I'm going to get through this 10 day juice fast. I'm going to get through the next 20 days of eating a whole foods based diet. I'm going to get through this three day juice fast. That's what it became about. I had weighed myself through Wii Fit, like Nintendo Wii Fit. 
And so there was this like uh, function on we fit where you don't necessarily have to see the numbers on the scale, but they'll measure it and they'll say, do you want to see the numbers? And I always opted for no. So I knew I was losing weight, but I didn't want to see what I weighed because it would be too triggering for me based on my disordered eating past. Mm -hmm. And what became like this unbelievable kind of smack in the face was that when you when you join we fit they create these little emoticons of you and so it started as like this little stick figure of like black hair and like a little stick figure wearing black clothes and then i step on and the little emoticon thing goes bloop, 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 <laughs> based on my weight and then some bitch says that's obese and i was like fuck you and <laughs> Like that was how I realized that the reflection of this cartoon looking back at me was actually what I looked like. So oh, wow. as I lost weight, my Bitmoji kept shrinking. Wow. And that was like this very weird sort of suspended reality. That's like so surreal. I know that you said that other people's response to you changed once you lost weight, but what about how you felt about yourself? Do you feel different now, a hundred pounds less? Do you love yourself more? Do you feel better in your body? I mean, I'm assuming you are happy that you lost weight for many reasons. Yeah, I'm happy that I lost weight. I'm <laughs> very happy that I did. But it it's more about the fact that I felt like I was becoming, you know, closer to my authentic self. And that is what is ultimately rooted in my happiness. It's not exactly rooted in the fact that I'm thinner now. It, it yeah, I feel more comfortable now than I ever have felt, but it isn't about the way I look physically. It's just about how I how I feel. And, you know, it's yes, I, I'm I'm always on a journey and, you know, I am constantly trying to assess what is toxic, what behaviors I have in my life that are toxic and remove them and then struggle through that process of like, oh, where's that toxic person or food or drink or whatever. So it's a journey. I'm I'm like a completely different person in a lot of ways than I was when I was 30. A lot of women that I talk to, even after they lose weight, they still feel like they're the size they were. Did that happen to you? Or do you know now that you are a hundred pounds less? Mm, uh, I will always feel like the fat kid, I think, to some extent. What about you? Um, I know I'm thin because uh, I'm seeing myself right now, but but I, I don't see myself the same as other people too, because what, you know, fat for 52 years, that takes a while for your brain to really, you know, cause I keep thinking like, this is, it's going to go away. You know, I, I know it's not as long as I continue to eat this way, but there's a part of me is so afraid to go back, you know, because I am, I, I feel better. I really do feel better. My knees just, just, it, it, you're right. It, it, if I look better to other people, so be it, but I feel better lighter. Right. Well, I, I mean, I just I also want to qualify what I said. I'm also I'm not dysmorphic about my body. When I say I feel like the fat kid in the back of the room, I'm more, yeah, it's more here. It's I know what you mean. I get you. I, I don't I recognize don't. what I look like. I think I'm very realistic about what I look like. I'm realistic about the fact that I like. You know, I feel like I could definitely brush up on my health right now in a lot of ways, and I'm working on it. You know, but I am also. I had a very long time of being very, very, very bullied, and that just doesn't go away. At first, I uh, was very skeptical about the way people were treating me. After I lost the weight, and people would start to hold doors and compliment my blazer, and I started to get a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I started to be really pissed off, and it was really when my grandmother was dying that I started to recognize that other people's perceptions of me should not inform how I see myself, and that that was my second kind of mind blowing thing that happened in my thirties, you know, first was losing all the weight. And then was when my, when my grandmother uh, was dying and I saw that she had gone from this ravishing beauty who everyone wanted to be next to, to someone who was living the rest of her life in a wheelchair and people would dismiss her. People who had previously celebrated her was dis were dismissing her. She didn't let it affect them. So the fact that she didn't let it affect them and she would just look them in the eye and answer for herself, even when they were addressing me as I pushed her wheelchair, the fact that she was like just speaking up for herself and uh, unflappable made me realize that whether or not people were treating me better or worse was irrelevant to how I should experience myself when I look in the mirror. So, you know, do I have that down? Absolutely not. But that is what I strive for every single day. Nice. Very, you know, you know, a lot of stuff is coming out now in the media, like with Harvey Weinstein and other actors saying that they were, you know, 
abused sexually, you know, and, and it's, it's almost like if one person comes out, it gives the other people the courage to come out. And you talk about being bullied and can we do something about that? Cause if that, I don't have kids. So, and I really wasn't bullied. I, I, I don't consider when somebody raised their hand at a cooking class and said, you know, if you're, if the vegan diet's so good, why are you so fat? I don't really, cons- I mean, that's not nice, but I know what you, you know, bullying is different. And right. The fact that it still goes on and, you know, you, you hear about children killing themselves because of cyberbullying. I mean, that that bothers me probably more than anything, you know, other than obviously the animal torture and abuse that goes on every day, which is oh, yeah. very hard to stop. But but how can we make that not OK? Because like I said, with Chef Dell a few weeks ago, somebody just makes makes, you know, now with the Internet, it's so much easier to bully people because you can do it anonymously and say things to people that you probably never would say to their face. But a lot of people in my ultimate weight loss program have kids that are being bullied. And I, it just, it breaks my heart and I don't know what to do about it. So what can we do about it? So that you, you that's, know, a, that, that's a big question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it definitely is better than when I grew up. I think that that, that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have flown at all. I, I think I should have been taken out of my school uh, I think that sometimes radical measures should be taken. I think if 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 a person is is going to a place where they are unsafe, then hopefully they they have adults in their life who will intervene on behalf of them and remove them from the unsafe situation. That's one thing that should happen, but that doesn't fix the systemic issue. Part of the systemic issue needs to be a humane education from a very early age for children to be learning compassion for others and for themselves to be uh, made aware of. Uh, how how to be of service to those individuals, human and non, who are othered based on their ability level, based on who, wh- what, you know, what set of circumstances they were born into, and to actually have consequences to their actions. And and I think that you know that's a pretty general way of saying we we cannot tolerate bullying. It is very very serious. And 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 uh, from a, a little bit more of a uh, even bigger bird's eye view, it has to start with us. So I grew up with a mother who loved me to the best of her ability, and it was a lot. She loved me a lot, but she was unhappy with herself. And if I had seen this person who was like happy with herself, perhaps I would have looked at myself differently. I'm certainly not blaming her. She was, you know, she was her own, she was her own grown up, flawed child self, just like we all are. But uh, if she had basically taken radical intervention with herself to live in alignment with her own values and her own ethics and stop letting other people dictate her self-worth, perhaps she would have experienced the world differently. Perhaps I would have earlier on. So we need to extend compassion to others. We need to extend compassion to ourselves. And we need to not, under any circumstances, tolerate a violent system. And a violent system includes bullying and it includes animal oppression. I agree. Nikki saying she dropped out of high school three times due to bullying about her weight. It's just, it's just so sad that this even happens. So did your relationship with your mom change at all when you lost weight? Did she, was she proud of you? Did you, did, did she love you more? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she did. She wouldn't say that. So I'm talking about my own experience with it. She, uh, she was like over the top proud of me. Like I was like, you know what? I mean, okay, I lost some weight. That's great. But like, wow, this is a big reaction, mom. So, you know, she was like, it, I felt for a long time, like I was the thin daughter she always wanted. And um, that was hard for me. But we've come a long way since then. And I've been much more accepting of her. I kind of think that that was and remains the missing element of my relationship with her. I think that she wound up being very accepting of me finally. And I sort of, I wasn't, I wasn't accepting of her and her own flaws and her own journey. So it's something I'm still working on now. She went vegan uh, right after I did, like a month after I did, 14 That's years. So cool. And your grandmother did too, eventually, yeah. right? My yeah. grandma at 86 years old. And if people are interested, my grandmother wrote an essay for our hen house. We, we used to publish articles as well. And so if you look for never too late to change the world, our hen house, that is my grandmother's article. And it was about the fact that like one day she realized it was wrong to eat animals. She happened to be 86 years old at the time. And it just became a continuum of her evolution. So when people say I can't change, I think that's bullshit. We can all change. 
that's really cool. Is your brother vegan yet? Because I know you have. Absolutely. Nope. <laughs> but I will say, so he's the one remaining family member who's not. I will say, he lives in Kansas City, that when I go to visit him, and he's, you know, my older brother, so he likes to josh me, and I'll open his refrigerator and I see an abundance of plant-based foods. And I, I and I look at his meals and I'm like, hmm, he's a lot closer than he's admitting. And I do think that like people who are leaning more and more into veganism is the what's going on now on a very big level. I want everyone to be totally vegan. I'm not gonna ever stop that bottom line, but I get really excited when people are making more and more vegan choices. All right, that's great. I hear you're writing another book, is that true? You did? You didn't say that? I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, but it's not true? I don't know why I must have. I will say that I have things in the works. Okay. That's I, are you I thought I heard that somewhere. Yeah. I, I, yes, my intention is to write another book, and there are things happening in that direction. That's pretty much all I can say at this point, but it is all very exciting. Well, you know, you're just, you're just such, I mean, really, you, you are a great writer and you could be in it. Like I could see you writing and I mean, you could write romance novels. Just the way you write is you're just <laughs> such a good writer. Your so romance good. novels would be tragic. <laughs> I know, but they'd be great. They'd be hilarious. And you know what else? You, you know, you had mentioned you wanted to be an actress. Did you want to be a specific kind of actress? Because I'm telling you, you would have been a great or still could be a great either comedic actress, stand up comic, com comedy actress or an improvisational actress. Thank you. I well, I really appreciate that. My hope is to actually workshop my my book as a one person show. And I did some I did some work in, in that realm. I did I workshopped a few scenes from it. That is my that is one of my goals. It does lend itself well to the stage for sure. I can see that. I can absolutely see that because that's why I really recommend guys well first of all I recommend you read the book, but but I really recommend the audio because it's just, it's so fun. It's just so great. To, I mean, it just, really, it's so yes. good. Thank I you. loved it. I loved it. And you can, if you're not on Audible already, you get the first two books for free and make that be one of your books, you know? I just, I'm, no, I didn't run this by you before the call, so I hope this is okay. If it's not, everything's just, okay. It's your power. Yeah. I have, you know, I, if if people want to get the book from watching from watching this, I can send you a signed copy if you want to get it from me directly, as opposed okay. to through Amazon. So I'll just tell you right now to email me at jasminesinger at gmail dot com, and it's okay. no e on Jasmine, so it's J A S M I N S I N G E R at gmail dot com, and just mention AJ in the subject and send me. Uh, I'll do it through PayPal only. So if you're able to do, if you're able to PayPal me, I'll send you the information. I'll send you a signed book within the next few days. So I just posted it on the screen so people can see it. Thank you so much. Send, yeah. So just to cover the shipping and the cost of the book, I, I I'd be able to send you a signed copy for twenty dollars. Um, it's you know you could get it for less on Amazon. It wouldn't be signed, and you wouldn't be getting my like essential oil rubbed off on it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. who, who inspires you the most? I know your grandma was one of the people for sure, but now, and is there anybody in the plant-based world that particularly inspires you? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, that's such a great question. Uh, you know, I mean, well, yes, I will say definitely my grandmother was my biggest inspiration and I, I'm given a lot of inspiration by the, by the people you never hear of. I'm given a lot of inspiration by the people who I've seen who have existed in the animal advocacy world for a very long time and they're in their own communities making changes and they're never asking for any kind of recognition. You know, a few people spring to mind. I think of Bonnie Goodman in Montana who is a jewelry designer and basically has half of her store like dedicated to like vegan outreach and animal advocacy. I think of uh, Michael Heron who has a, a show, the animal show that he's touring around the country with and and it's just about his journey into activism and animal rights I think about uh, Tracy Martin who rescues bunnies in Spokane and has a really sweet bunny sanctuary called Rabbitron and and I just think of like the the people who are who are in their own communities against all odds and are trying to change their lives and also to better social justice while they're at it so the people who inspire me the most are the people who whose whose lives brush my own and I don't even remember all of their names but those to me are the real heroes I agree with you I was I was on some podcast once or some interview and they said who inspires you and you know I mean I have people like Victor Frankel that I've never met certain people from history but the people that do animal 
rescue just even even just like in the neighborhood you know like like they'd have like like little shelters you know and because i couldn't do that i couldn't do i mean I, I shouldn't say i couldn't i choose not to do it because my heart breaks so much like if i go to an animal shelter i cry i can't i I, I mean, I could do it. I don't. And the people that do that or the people that do the civil disobedience and direct action, these are things I did 30 years ago. And that I, they are the unsung heroes of the animal, yeah. world, you know. The, yeah, you know. absolutely. I'm I'm really inspired too by uh, you know people who are making art and making media because mm -hmm. I think that you know it's very difficult to quantify how social change happens based on art and media but it 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 inf it's like to me the threading of our of our society is what's beautiful and what moves us on an emotional level so you know it's it's people who I'm grateful to work with like Colleen Holland who's the founder yeah. of Veg News and She's my adorable. Well, and speaking my of art my t-shirt let me see if I can show the whole thing it says vegan oh I love it and it was made by Michael I don't know if it's pronounced Rangel or Rangel, but the Humane Project, I got this t-shirt. So that's our, that's one thing I always do. You know, I don't do the same kind of activism like I used to, but I always make sure there's something on me somewhere that identifies that I'm vegan. You know, when I go to the gym, I had these sweatbands made and I had them custom made and it said vegan since 1977. So whether it's a t-shirt, a sweatband, earrings, a necklace, there's always something on me so that somebody knows. You know, going to an airport tomorrow, going through TSA, there's always something that it's gonna spark a conversation or obviously when I'm eating, you know, I sit there and I bring out my trough of, you know, kale and sweet potatoes and that always starts a conversation. Well, so. Social change happens person to person and by example. So the power of like, what you're buying at the grocery store is actually bigger than you might realize. The power of asking a, a waiter or the chef at a restaurant for the vegan option or is is something that someone next to them might hear. And that should not be discounted in our own leaps to change the world for animals. What would you if you what would you say to your former self if you could have talk to her like because I guess she didn't know things were going to get better back then um I would say that you're lovable yeah it sort of makes me emotional <laughs> to think about it you know but like well, I think that like that's that's at the root of of so much of our shit is that like you know it's that big void that we all have and what do we fill it with toxins we fill it with crappy food we fill it with crappy people we fill it with things that are not good for us mm -hmm. and the root of that void is this underlying belief that we were fed early on that we are not good enough that that like we have to be authentic by way of hiding our truths and you know that's a void that for many of us is present in one form or another through the entirety of our lives and i think that like starting with something as empowering as what we're eating in approaching uh the void is one of the easiest things we can do because in a world where we have very little control we have control over how we're spending our dollars and how we're eating and so that to me is the ultimate empowerment that i know that what i'm putting into my mouth is something that, that i can control and that i can uh that I can use as a vehicle to get closer to who I actually want to show up as in this world for myself. My good friend, Sharon McRae, who actually listened to your book on Audible before I did, said that you are so eloquent and I agree. I have a great title for your next book. How about I'm enough, you're enough. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot. You know, it's interesting because, you know, it seems that all animals that are, going to be food or abused, obviously, but it seems like the torture and abuse is worse towards the females. You know what I'm saying? The dairy yeah. cow, the totally. hen, and, eggs. and it's sort of like uh, the same thing that in real life, you know, human life too, that, 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 that we, that it's the children, it's the women that are more marginalized and abused than the males of the species. And I, I don't like that personally. Yeah, well, that's why I went vegan. I mean, I was a long time vegetarian. Nowadays, I think people are going vegan, like without that kind of middle ground of vegetarian. But in my day, people often went vegetarian first. Right. And I was vegetarian for a long time. And it was the exploitation of the reproductive systems of female animals, in particular, dairy cows and egg laying hens, that made me realize that my own personal view of my feminism did not work with 
consuming these the exploited reproductive capacities of other female animals. So as someone who was myself raped, which I talk about in the book, I could not for the life of me continue to support an industry that was reliant on the rape of dairy cows. And as someone who was just, you know, very into women's rights and and uh, like just social justice as a whole, it felt to me like it was becoming hypocritical for me to continue to support a system that was reliant on, you know, taking babies from their mothers. Of course, it's bad for the boys too, for sure. I mean, it yep. was, I was like 10 years into being vegan before I was th even thought about what semen extraction looked like for the for the males, you know, the male cows. And, and that was shocking to me that it never occurred to me. So to me, I can't possibly stand up for myself as a feminist and consume dairy or eggs. That, that would be, that's a great message to get out to other feminists that are maybe not vegan yet, you know? Mm -hmm. I think more and more people are becoming vegan. All of the, you know, the trends seem to be going in that direction. It seems to be uh, understood by mainstream media that they could only fight it for so long before, you know, before they realize that veganism is here to stay and we aren't going anywhere. You ever thought about running for public office? I would vote for you in a second. Really? <laughs> That's sweet. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll do it. <laughs> okay, really? So, you know, you have the potential to inspire so many people with just your story, just, just even just the weight loss part without the whole history. So I'm going to give you time to just talk about whatever you want and, and go inspire these, these mostly women that are watching because a lot of them are, are you. You know, I think that there was a lot of empowerment in what you've just said for me to realize that I am not actually that different. In fact, I'm pretty much you, as we've discussed, and I'm everyone else who's watching this and you're me and we're all struggling through the same stuff. So when you feel alone in it, know that you're not. And when you feel alone in the addictive pull to that toxic substance or that toxic food, know that there actually is a way out. And when we're feeling absolutely hopeless, and I have my moments too, absolutely, I feel hopeless sometimes. I now have this kind of bigger sort of understanding that there will be an answer that will present itself. And if I can just kind of sit in the pain, I recognize that just like when I'm juice fasting and I get a little diarrhea, it has to come out at some point. When I'm sitting there and I'm crying and I'm sitting in the grief and the pain of trying to extricate myself from these toxic patterns, the pain I'm feeling, it has to come out. So it's not for nothing, don't squelch it. Don't squelch the pain, sit with it, and then make better choices the next day. I also think we have to support each other as women, as just people in a small community who are all trying to change the world for ourselves and change the world for animals. We have to be able to have accountability to ourselves through the reflection of a safe, supportive community. You can find that with Chef AJ and with the community that you provide here. And you can find that in your very own community. If you're not lucky enough to be in a community where you can easily tap into those people, start by finding it online. It's not mm -hmm. perfect, but it's something. It's really or, or create one. If you don't see it, build one. Start your yeah. own. Yeah, absolutely. Find and foster community. I never would have gone vegan without community. And I never would have been able to like switch into a healthier lifestyle without community. So it's actually, it's, you know, it's a good message for me. I moved here to California a little over a year ago. I left, I was in New York City for 20 years nearly. And I, I left my entire, all my people and it's been rough. It's been a hard year. And so the thing that gets me through it is, is recognizing that I have community accessible to me. If I'm not tapping into it, that's on me, not on them. So I would say understand that we're all struggling and understand that if you're a lifelong learner, then you'll wind up getting better. You'll wind up eating healthier. You'll wind up looking like the reflection of how you feel on the inside. And it's going to take a little bit of struggle. But that's how any change happens is through struggle. But it's worth it, right? Totally. Yeah. Who's that dog? And can I have him or yeah, her? Bailey. She always, you know, it's so funny. She she'll ignore me all day, but the minute that this, that, you know, that we're doing something. So, you know, she was rescued at four years old at a shelter, and uh, you know, my, one of my messages, even if I can't make people go vegan, is to adopt. 
There's yeah. nothing that drives me crazier than puppy mills or breeding. You know, people breed and buy while homeless animals die. So I just, and, and she's actually a purebred. I didn't know it. She's a Hava noodle, Havanese poodle. But I got her at four and I got her at the shelter and she's just a great dog. I think that that's, oh, she's really sweet. I think so, that's a really good point. A lot of people are like, uh, just sort of not realizing that there's only so many homes. And so if you're going to like go out and buy a dog, that means that some dog got, just got killed. That's It's absolutely. as simple as that. I mean, the statistics, of course, worse for farm animals for food, but but it's something like a thousand dogs and cats each week just in Los Angeles. So you can imagine the national statistics are even even more, you know, it's just, yeah. it's, that, that's what all, that just, it drives me crazy, right? Yeah. Baby, right? So what's next for you? And are you, are you speaking anywhere that we could come hear you if people wanted to? Yeah, I'm always speaking somewhere. <laughs> if you go to jasminesinger.com, you can click on events. I have three speaking engagements coming up the first weekend of December, including nice. on December 3rd, I'll be speaking at the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition's Gala in San Francisco. Fantastic. And that's so definitely I'm the I'm the the special speaker at that. I hope you can make it. On December 2nd, which is the day before that, if I'm doing my math correctly, there is a teleconference called Awaken that I will be the guest speaker on. So you could just be in your pajamas or naked, whatever, no judgment. Uh, <laughs> Go to, I actually, yeah, jasminesinger.com. You'll be able to find the information about the Awaken Conference. On December 1st, I'll be speaking at a PCRM event, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in San Jose. Also, the information will be coming to my website soon, jasminesinger.com. You can catch me on the Our Hen House podcast every single week. And uh, there's a few other speaking engagements. I'm always up for book events as well. So if you have a venue and you want to bring me to your community, I'm, I'm, I'm always open to whatever. So, and next for me is, you know, I'm still working tirelessly on Veg News and I am the love columnist at Veg News. <laughs> so if you need love advice, I don't know how they gave me that responsibility, but for some reason I have it. And so it's in the actual magazine. So just get a subscription to Veg News at vegnews.com. And uh, what else? Like I said, I have some exciting things underway book-wise that I can't really talk about. That's but. okay. Well, we hope, well, let me know when it happens and we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. You know, I, I don't know if the people I know, I don't know if so much they need love advice, but they want to know how to find a vegan mate. That's what I hear, especially uh, from Totally. From yeah. so if you can write an article on how to do that. I think you'll, <laughs> I have specific vegan girlfriends that are in their early 50s that are smoking hot, wonderful people. They can't, I mean, it's not that they can't find anybody but they want a vegan guy you know yeah or or woman whatever oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just think you have two friends that particularly they, they, they I want to but you get what i'm saying yeah oh believe me i get what you're saying <laughs> i get what you're saying you know yeah. i think like that's just a journey that we're all on to and uh I have definitely converted my share of non-vegans to veganism by way of the bedroom. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I'm at this point in my life where I'm like, I don't want to convert anybody. I just want. Well, that's what I always say. You know, like they say, well, my husband won't eat this way. So we'll just stop having sex with him until he does. That's what I would do. You know, that's, the best hour you <laughs> that's good. Well, it's just been such a pleasure talking to you. You're just, I just love you. You're just, I think you're the cool kid. You know, I, I think you were just, you were just either dropped off in the wrong family at the wrong place or time because if, if you had to do it all over again today you would be the cool kid you are the cool kid yeah. as far as i'm concerned Very you know. so guys if you just joined us you can watch the replay in its entirety right away i'll have it on youtube within 24 hours i was talking to jasmine singer the author of always too much never enough you can get it on amazon but if you go to her website which is jasmine singer no e and jasmine j-a-s-m-i-n singer.com she will send you a signed copy <laughs> Email me and I'll, I'll send you a signed copy. For yeah, we well, have to pay for it though. She's not going to just send it, but yes, she, <laughs> just, just to make that clear. So thank right. you so much for taking your lunch hour to talk to us. And right. thanks all of you guys for watching another episode of Healthy Living Live. Come back at 4 p.m. for Weight Loss Wednesday. Thank you, Jasmine. Thanks thank all of you for watching. I'm Chef AJ and I make healthy taste delicious. <laughs>